As the aviation industry in the 1950s and 60s embraced supersonic speeds, defined avionics theory, and toyed with eccentric airframe designs, the A7 Corsair II stood out as a peculiarly fascinating story. The Corsair II was a unique-looking warplane that lacked the supersonic capabilities of many aircraft of its time, but whose reliability and versatility allowed it to stay in service even when its flashier counterparts were being replaced by more ambitious proposals, and it quickly became a crucial asset for the U.S. Navy. Developed for the Vietnam War, the Corsair II proved to be a trusty and devastating strike aircraft that traded over-the-top features for a formidable range, increased payload capacity, and an affordable price. With its iconic oversized air intake and unique airframe, the warplane would be nicknamed the Slough or Short Little Ugly f by the Navy crews. Still, there was nothing ugly about its performance. An Aircraft Revolution As early as the 1940s, the American combat aviation industry underwent a drastic and hectic series of shifts and evolutions that resulted in the turbulent and breakneck development of dozens of fascinating warplanes, each more ambitious than the last. The concept of avionics was just being defined, and aircraft manufacturers focused on incorporating supersonic technology in most of their newest designs. The bold proposals resulted in unique and innovative airframes that often suffered from short operational life. By the time they were deployed, a new and improved warplane was already coming out of the aircraft factory. Incorporating new technologies and daring airframe designs meant the projects were expensive to research, develop, and manufacture, which became an incredibly cumbersome problem considering the warplanes were swiftly replaced. Then, as the U.S. fully entered the Vietnam War, its leading seaborne aircraft was the A-4 Skyhawk, an agile and reliable vehicle that was reaching the end of its operational life. The Vought Corporation was eager to develop a replacement, as its short-range and light payload capabilities were rendered obsolete for modern warfare scenarios. The ever-evolving philosophy of the time led Vought to create formidable and ambitious designs like the tailless F-7U Cutlass or the influential supersonic F-8U Crusader, which stood out as a remarkable weapons platform. Still, as impressive as the Crusader was, it was an expensive warplane that continued using guns as its primary weapon, rendering it ineffective as a strike aircraft in the Vietnam conflict. The U.S. Navy needed an affordable and reliable strike warplane that put aside all the bells and whistles driving development costs through the roof and centered on an outstanding operational range and superb strike performance. To reduce costs even further, the new aircraft had to use the airframe of an already existing warplane, and Vought believed the Crusader was the perfect starting base for such a design. Less is more. By the 1960s, the U.S. Navy had understood that despite its incredible advantages, supersonic speed was of little use to low-altitude strike aircraft, only shooting up the development and maintenance costs. A sea-based Air Strike Forces study group meticulously analyzed a total of 144 hypothetical aircraft to support the findings. The result was an unexpected deviation from the current aircraft development philosophy. Subsonic light strike aircraft could achieve superior performance to a supersonic one. The study concluded that the airframe could be smaller, cheaper, and easier to manufacture by preceding supersonic capability. Consequently, in what might have seemed like an odd step backward to the average onlooker, the Navy requisitioned a subsonic aircraft. Instead of speed, they wanted range and the ability to carry a much larger payload. The request was not insignificant. The Navy wanted a strike plane that had at least two times the range of the old Skyhawk and twice the payload capacity while remaining cheap to produce and upkeep. The new project's goal was to create a warplane specialized in low-altitude dive attacks while shortening the development time as much as possible by using an already trusted airframe as its starting point. Vought aviation engineer Russell Clark embraced the unique challenge and immediately assembled a team to take the reliable F-8U Crusader and transform it into a long-range, low-altitude strike aircraft. As an aircraft-launched plane, the new Corsair would have to remain compact and sturdy with the ability to land and take off from limited spaces. Also, the aircraft had to be able to be produced in mass numbers, in contrast to many other flashier supersonic warplanes. 
From its earliest tests, the Corsair II exceeded all expectations. With 8,800 miles of range, it had four times the operational range of the Skyhawk, a much larger capacity for payload that exceeded 20,000 pounds and an increased top ceiling. Impressively, it was also slightly faster than its predecessor. Inside the machine. The original versions of the Corsair II were equipped with a single Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P6 turbofan engine that replaced the afterburner-equipped J57 P20A turbojet engine of the F-8. As the new light attack aircraft began to be produced massively, the engine manufacturer had problems meeting the military and civilian demand for that specific model. As such, later iterations were equipped with other engines. The Corsair II was eventually powered by the Pratt & Whitney TF-38 and the Allison TF-41A2 engines, as well as a licensed model of the Rolls-Royce Spey engine. Air was fed to the engine by a simple large nose inlet, which gave the aircraft its peculiar appearance. It also posed a significant hazard to flight deck personnel, who had to develop specialized protocols to maintain the plane. Meanwhile, an aerial refueling system was mounted on the right-hand side of the nose, which allowed for mid-air refueling, boosting even further the already impressive range of the Corsair II. Two cannons were mounted on the underside of the nose, and a mounting for AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles on either side of the fuselage was used for self-defense against aerial threats. Later variations had the two cannons replaced with a single M61A1 Vulcan rotary cannon. To reduce susceptibility to ground fire, the flying control hydraulic systems were triplicated. Other systems improved, and much of the fuselage had reinforced armor protection. The Corsair was often armed with the remarkable AGM-62 Walleye television-guided glide bomb, and this unique fire-and-forget bomb would be aimed using a video screen inside the cockpit. As the pilot acquired a target on the screen, he would lock the target and fire. After that, the pilot could flee the scene as the bomb smartly glided to the targeted location. The A-7 was fitted with an AN-APQ-116 radar, later followed by the AN-APQ-126, which was integrated into the LIAAS digital navigation system. The radar also fed an IBM navigation and weapons delivery computer, which allowed for accurate delivery of bombs from a more considerable standoff distance. All in all, the Corsair had an outstanding avionics system that surpassed most aircraft of its time. Furthermore, it was the first U.S. aircraft to have a modern heads-up display, which exhibited vital information such as dive angle, airspeed, altitude, drift, and targeting reticle. The technology quickly became a must-have instrument in every U.S. combat aircraft. Operational History The A-7 Corsair II flew its first combat missions over Vietnam in May of 1970 and was part of the Navy's offensive firepower during the Operation Linebacker Strikes and the aerial mining of North Vietnamese ports in 1972. Pilots immediately fell in love with the new platform, considering it a responsive and easy-to-fly warplane that excelled at low-altitude strikes and had an incredible range. David Frosty Olson, who accumulated more than 3,500 hours flying the Corsair A7A, B, C, E, and H, as well as performing 750 carrier landings, gave a more detailed description of the platform's highs and lows. Quote, as an attack aircraft, it was a very stable platform, and it handled nicely, but it bled off energy fairly quickly, and without an afterburner, during air combat maneuvers, we would end up dropping from the sky, like a turd from a tall moose, just to keep us at the corner velocity. Still, in the right hands, an A-7 could do a tolerable job, but it wasn't a fighter aircraft, although its fuel capacity also made it an airborne tanker. A total of 1,500 warplanes were built, and the Corsair II became the backbone of aerial carrier-launched operations during the conflict, with up to 854 models participating in over 97,000 sorties. Most of the missions carried out by the A-7 would continue to be low-altitude dive strikes that stood out for their reliability and bullseye accuracy. Ultimately, the Corsair II only lost 54 units throughout its combat service in the Vietnam War, and despite fears that its lack of supersonic speeds would make it a prime target for enemy fighters after a dive attack, the A-7 continued to serve decades after its initial debut, and several different iterations were developed. In total, the warplane has flown over 120,000 combat sorties and has fought extraordinarily well in conflicts in Vietnam, Libya, 
Granada, Panama, and Operation Desert Storm. In an age of ambitious, over-the-top aircraft design, the Corsair II proved that sometimes the best aircraft was not the fastest or the most expensive, but the one you could build in large numbers and keep the pilots safe. Thank you for watching our video. Don't hesitate to click on your screen and check out another of our Duck Documentaries channels, where we explore thrilling military events and fascinating war technology. And hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.